Well, Russ, it's uh, nice to talk to you again uh, since this morning. We had a little chat. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I would love to. I would love to hear all your about all your amazing research on the video now. Uh, if we can start off with um, explaining who you are. Well, I'm Russ Bergholt, and um, I am the uh, the uh, founder of the Shroud of Turin Education Project Inc. Uh, here in the United States. And uh, we have an 11 word mission statement, which is to advance the knowledge of the Shroud to a new generation. And um, so I've been involved in this uh, for 35 years. So uh, I was uh, I was uh, I was back in college. And the news of the Shroud was very big. This is all the way back in 1980. And the, uh, and the scientists had gone over to Turin in 1978. And so there was lots of news coming out about it. And uh, so I asked the, uh, the editors of the paper if I could write a couple articles on the Shroud because I thought it was really intriguing. And then in June of that year, National Geographic came out with a big article about the Shroud. And then my articles came out in the uh, in the fall of 1980, and so in the process of doing all of the all the research for those articles, talked to several scientists on the phone to get some quotes and things, and I was hooked. I was basically came away with saying, "Man, this is an incredible mystery, and nobody knows anything about it." And so that began. Uh, and then I attended the um, the first. Uh, uh, United States uh, Scientific Symposium on the Shroud in 1981, which was in New London, Connecticut. This is where all the scientists uh, uh, presented their various papers uh, in a, in a two-day conference, and all those papers went on to be published in about 24 different peer-reviewed scientific journal articles. Well, that's when I got to meet everybody, at least in the in the in the science world and the world of history and archaeology. That's uh, Involved in the Shroud, and so I've been involved ever since. Brilliant! So thirty-five years of research. Yes, sir. That's not bad, is it? You can't, you can't, can't get much better than that, I don't think. <laughs> um, can you? Can we move on to um, questions? Let's go for the start. The questions. In do you believe there is clear evidence that the person on the Shroud died from the crucifixion? Well, I would say that there's certainly, uh, you know, I, I have to defer, of course, to to the uh, to the forensic pathologists who have studied the shroud, and uh, and uh, you know there have been there have been several, and they affirm that this is the, appears to be the image of a real human being who died from these wounds, and um, and so the uh, you know so the so you know, if you can first establish that this is the image of a real human being um, and, and not the work of some alleged medieval artist, and then I think you have to, then you can ask that question, you know, is this man alive or dead? And the forensic pathologists have weighed in and say, he's dead. Now, 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 the, now one, of the, one of the key reasons is because there's a, there's a whole pattern of blood stains on the shroud that are unique to the wounds sustained by Jesus as recorded in Scripture. And, you know, you have your crown of thorns, and, you know, puncture wounds all around the head. Yep, yep. You have a scourging all over the body, about 120 scourge marks on the body. You have nail wounds in the wrist, nail wounds in the feet. And then, and then you also have a side wound. Well, that side wound shows blood flowing down from the wound and then for some reason puddling across the small of the back. Now, there is a very distinctive clear areas in that blood stain where there seems to very to be the very there seems to be an obvious separation of blood and blood serum. And now this doesn't happen unless the body is dead. And so the um, so the uh, if you pause that for a second, hold on. Yeah, no problem. Simon, I apologize. I yeah. had my phone. I was gonna. I was gonna disconnect my phone. And I forgot to do it. No problem at all, Russ. Oh, so, I'm sorry. So we're let's let's just um, can we just take that from the top? Yeah. So we uh, was discussing the evidence that you you know of what's on the shroud of his cru of his death from the crucifixion, basically. Right. So when we so when we look at the you know so when we look at the work of the of the forensic pathologists who have studied the. Uh, the shroud, you know, clearly they identify 
this man as dead and uh, and that he was a man and not some not doesn't appear to be the work of an artist and so and, and again when you when you look at all of the all of the wounds sustained on the shroud that are uh, that are that are that, that match the gospel account uh, such as the crown of thorns a whole series of puncture wounds all around the head about 120 scourge marks on the about on the uh, on the body uh, you know nail wounds in the wrist nail wounds in the feet um, and then and then and then you have a wound in the side now we know from scripture that this wound in the side occurred after Jesus was already dead it was done to make sure that he was dead before the body uh, would be released to Joseph of Arimathea who was the man who owned the linen shroud he is also the, the man who owned the uh, the tomb in which Jesus would be would, would later be placed in and so Good and because point. Joseph had asked for the body, mm. they had to make sure that he was dead before they could release that body to Joseph for burial. And uh, so that's why he was stabbed in the side. Good when point. Can I, just help, can I just stop you there? Good, very good point, that is. Can I just pick you up on that? Otherwise, they would have broke his legs, but instead they pierced him. Is that correct? Well, right, because when the soldiers initially came by, um, usually... Uh, because it was on the eve of the Sabbath. Now, on any other day, they might have let them stay alive all, all night long. Mm. But because it was on the eve of the Sabbath, um, they, they had agreed to take the bodies down uh, you know, prior to the beginning of the Sabbath. And, um, and so in order to speed death, yeah. they would break the legs under the, under the knees, would, would literally use about a 15-pound wooden mallet and shatter the bones under the knees. You can't stand on broken legs. Would die from asphyxia, which is the inability to breathe, and add to that hypovolemic shock. And so, so within 10 to 15 minutes, they're going to be dead. And then they would typically take those bodies down and throw them into a common grave. Then the Jewish authorities asked Pilate to allow them to break the legs of the men who had been crucified and to take the bodies down from the crosses. They requested this because it was Friday, and they did not want the bodies to stay on the crosses on the Sabbath, since the coming Sabbath was especially holy. So the soldiers went and broke the legs of the first man, and then of the other man, who had been crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, so they did not break his legs. One of the soldiers, however, plunged his spear into Jesus' side. <laughs> and at once, blood and water poured out. The one who saw this happen has spoken of it so that you may also believe. What he said is true, and he knows that he speaks the truth. This was done to make the scripture come true. Not one of his bones will be broken. And there is another scripture that says, people will look at him whom they pierced. Scripture is clearly, it says, but when they came to Jesus, they noticed that he was already dead, therefore they did not break his leg. Yes. But, however, um, that proves were, he was dead. Um, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was pointless to break the, the legs because, um, you know, why bother? The whole point of breaking legs was to, was to bring about a, a asphyxia. Well, mm. he was already dead, so he didn't need to break his leg. Absolutely. But, however, they did need to make sure that he was dead before they could release him over to Joseph. That's when they stabbed him in the side with a spear. And instead, an outflowed, and the, John's Gospel says, outflowed blood and water, um, what we, from a medical standpoint, was probably blood and blood serum. Where, and it's, uh, because there would have been a, been a, a collection of blood in his, uh, in, his, uh, in his chest cavity, and had, de had Jesus been dead on the cross for maybe a period of, of about 30 minutes, 
um, there would have been a separation of the blood and the blood serum in his chest cavity that would have that that would have collected there just because of the ordeal that he had that that he had gone through. And some of that clear area could also be pleural fluid from his uh, from his lungs as well. And um, so so outflow would appear to John to be blood and water, but was most likely blood and blood serum, a blood that had separated. And we and and we see that clear separation on the on the blood stain that is that is uh, you know going down from the side wound and then also um, streaming across the back. Now, the you know, it's, you know one of the arguments that people will say about that that isn't post mortem blood flow is that they will say that that once 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 a corpse or once a person's dead. The blood is no longer flowing, and therefore the, the blood wouldn't 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 come out of that wound. It would just stay in the body. Mm. Maybe, however, not if you're moving the body. So they had to they had to take that body down from the cross, and then they had to move that body from the cross all the way to the tomb. So every time they they would they would move the, the body, there is an opportunity. For the blood to kind of come out of that side wound, and uh, so so you don't so you don't necessarily you know uh, when you uh, so I I think that that argument or that uh, that objection can uh, can easily be uh, be uh, countered. Um, so you know some of the other evidence that 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 this man is dead is that there is a there is a uh, the the uh, the abdomen appears to be extended. Uh, which was an, which is an indicator of rigor mortis. His his uh, his legs are drawn up. His shoulders are drawn up. So he's in the same position um, in the cloth as he was on the cross. Well, the only reason that that would happen is if the body is in rigor mortis. When you would be in the body is all stiff. Absolutely. And they would have literally have had to have break broken rigor mortis to bring those arms down. When, when they were in a in a position on the cross, they would have to bring them, break rigor mortis, bring them down, or, you know, to and basically tie them with a strip, in order to keep them from basically, you know, going right back up again. It's um, and so the uh, which is why, you know, some of the some of the uh, folks that object to the shroud will point to the verses verse in um, in John chapter twenty, verses one through nine where. It says that you know that 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 they saw strips of linen, and so they say, "Aha! That the uh, the uh, the shroud can't be authentic because they wound the body like some kind of mummy." Hmm. Well, that's absurd because the by the time the first century rolled around, even the Egyptians were no longer winding their bodies with strips of linen. They were they were they were using a single linen shroud, and so the and so the. The use of the word strips in John Gospel in John's Gospel could easily refer to strips that are binding the wrist, binding the ankle, binding the head, and and then a single linen shroud, perhaps also um, the uh, 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 other strips of linen may be bound around the outside of the cloth. Now, here's what's very interesting: is that according to the, uh, uh, according to the Jewish way of death and mourning. Um, when you die by normal death, there is uh, your body would be washed. You would probably be given three articles of grave clothes: a a tunic, which is kind of like goes from the neck all the way down to the feet, and there's no sleeves. And then you and then a, a second cloth over the face, most likely the Jewish talit or the prayer cloth. Mm. And then thirdly, a full long linen shroud wrapping the whole package, but not in the event of violent death. In violent death, when someone has has lost a significant amount of blood, there is no washing of the body. Uh, there is no removal of um, removal of the clothes. Um, if you were talking about today. You know, if you were Jewish and you were living in Tel Aviv and you had a terrible car wreck and your blood and you're dead and there's blood all over the body, well, guess what? They're not even going to remove your clothes. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. They're simply gonna they're simply gonna wrap you in a single linen shroud. Yeah. Now today they'll put you in a casket, but back then they would have just wrapped you in a single linen shroud, and you've been in, and you would have been in the ground or in the tomb that day. So so we so so the rules according to violent death is that there is no washing of the body, which is called tahara, and and there is and, and it would be a single linen shroud. That's consistent with what we see on the shroud, a man who died by violent death. Absolutely. So I think all those and plus the plus the 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 sheer logic of it that some people would allege that, that Jesus somehow survived the ordeal and hooked up with Mary Magdalene and moved to the south of France and raised a family. I mean, there's all kinds of, you know, you know, ludicrous, you know, notions out there. Mm -hmm. But the point is, is that the the Romans were skilled Mm -hmm. at execution. I mean, that's what they did. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, crucifixion. I mean, so the very notion that they somehow allowed Jesus to escape death is ludicrous in my mind. Absolutely. Can I just quit, um, say something about you talking about the strips? Now, I've searched the, the scriptures thoroughly, and the Greek language there is actually doesn't mention strips. There's nowhere in the Greek language it mentions strips. It says cloths or cloth or cloths. Now, right. I, I understand, it, but there's a theory that there was a strip used on the outside to to, ba- to bind the cloth itself. But there's, there's no word strip. Not one word strips in there. Only Lazarus was. You, if you look uh, look under Lazarus, that says strips, but not on, on in any any of the Gospels does it say does it mention the word strips? I couldn't it find them. Uses, uh, the Greek language that is. It uses a word called athonia, which right, right. means which is which is reference to more than one linen cloth that they saw. Right, um, right. In the tomb, modern English translations, some translations will translate it as strips. Right. Oh, and I so, see. I just address this front and center because I do a lot of lecturing all over the all all the time, mm. and every so often I'll have you know someone come loaded for bear with with their you know and they got their Bible out and they're going to turn right to John nine you know you know uh, you know uh, twenty verses one through nine mm. they're going to reference strips yeah and I so this is why I address it front and center and the uh, the the also. Where I think there is some confusion among archaeologists is the fact that uh, now remember Moses grew up in the court of Pharaoh, spent forty years, uh, you know, living as an Egyptian, and then finally he decided to, you know, he he saw the plight of his own people as slaves, and so he decided to do something about it, or God said, wait, him go do something about it, you know, and so. Now, shortly after, when you when you look at at, at, at how the um, you know after the Jews left Egyptian slavery and and then they and then they got into the Promised Land and and then finally along comes David and ultimately Solomon. The, uh, the, the this is the this is the uh, this is the first Temple period. We're talking maybe I think maybe around 700 B.C. At this time. You can find, you can do excavation and find bodies of, 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 of Jews who are kind of like Jewish mummies, where they are wound with strips of linen like an Egyptian mummy. Yeah, but yeah. that's the first temple period. Yes. Did that, you know, and that's, that's because the Jews had learned a lot of their traditions from the Egyptians. Mm. But now fast forward 700 years to yeah. the first century, and now the Egyptians weren't even doing it then, and so so and and so and and so all of their and, and so all of that you know gradually changes as they as they over the centuries lose their identity that they had acquired in Egypt, and um, so I think that's a that's a that's a credible explanation for why we see one method of interment in the first temple period and a different you know method. By the time the second temple is uh, comes around, yeah. I mean, I get people emailing me all the time, telling me, you know they bring up that word 
that it, it, the gen, it can't be genuine, the shroud, because it, it says strips in the Bible. But then I say right. to him, well, show me one word. I say to him, show me one word that shows me. It says strips, and they go silent. <laughs> but, right, I mean, right. um, let's touch what you say. You're telling us about the, the, the spear wound. That is substantial evidence that Jesus was dead, from what you were oh, saying. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because and, I, you know, and the, uh, I mean, the, I mean, most of the, uh, the forensic pathologists have said he died from, uh, from, uh, uh, from asphyxia and, 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 uh, and hypovolemic shock, which is just, hypovolemic shock is just really the result of severe dehydration. Yeah. Um, and as you can, you know, as you can imagine, all that scourging, every time you lose blood, you get dehydrated. And so there was a significant loss of blood and, uh, that's probably the cause of that. Well, I, I don't know about you, but I don't. I've never seen any records or anything mentioned about anyone who's been crucified and who's been spit, who's been speared. Do you? I, I don't, there ain't none, is there? No, there's not. I mean, you were either either scourged and released yeah. as a form of punishment, or you were crucified to be executed. Hmm. And if you were, to, and if your sentence was execution. Then you're going to be executed, and it's um, the uh, you know what's interesting though is that you know one of there's a there's you know several you know anomalies related to 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 the shroud is that you have the image of a man who has been severely scourged, so and crucified. Now why is this the case? Well, because if you read the scriptures, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea didn't think Jesus was guilty of a crime worthy of capital punishment. He didn't want to kill him. And so and so the first thing he did was send him to King Herod. Herod sends him back. And then he tried to trade Barabbas, that's some kind of a trade. That didn't work. And so finally, in a last ditch effort, he has him scourged to within an inch of his life, thinking that when this bloodied hulk of a man comes walking back into the courtyard, that maybe they'd say, well, okay, I guess we don't have to kill him. But that's not what happened, is it? So even though he was brutally scourged, they still wanted him dead. And so, and so, and this is this is one of the things that I that I bring out when uh, when people ask me uh, the question, "Well, how do you know it's Jesus? It could be the shroud of anybody." Mm-hmm. Well, no, 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 because number one, you were you were almost always either just ex- I mean, uh, 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 crucified. You might have gotten a few scourges, but you weren't scourged brutally because they wanted you to remain alive on the on the cross all day long they don't want they weren't trying to kill you by scourging um and so so you were either crucified or scourged as a form of punishment and how many times in the in the in the book of acts do we read where the apostle paul was scourged and then the very next day he's preaching again in the synagogue you know they weren't trying to kill him they were trying to punish him and um and so the, uh, but, but I think though that, um, so th- this is an important distinction because again, identifying who this man is, you know, the, the number one identifier is the crown of thorns. Thorns, the absolutely. The crown of thorns was a singular yeah. mockery for the man who claimed to be king of the Jews. Yes. It wasn't a routine of ordinary crucifixion. Which no one I in the mean, world has had you know, that, had a crown of thorns. There's no record of any person that's worn a crown of thorns who has been crucified apart from Jesus, is there? Absolutely not. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it was designed to be a mockery. And, um, and then, of course, he's brutally scourged. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him whipped. The soldiers made a crown out of thorny branches and put it on his head. Then they put a purple robe on him and came to him and said, Long live the king of the Jews. And they went up and slapped him. Pilate went back out once more and said to the crowd, Look, I will bring him out here to you to let you see that I cannot find any reason to condemn him. Look, here is the man. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Crucify! 
crucify him. Crucify him. You take him then and crucify him. I find no reason to condemn him. We have a law that says he ought to die because he claimed to be the son of God. Right. We obviously, we know the name was in the wrist, the name was in the feet, but then we also have that side wound. Why the side wound? Because Jesus was already dead when the when the when the when the uh, when the soldiers came by. But this may be the biggest anomaly of all: is the fact that you have the image of a man who was clearly crucified. That means he died a criminal's death, and yet he is wrapped in a rich man's shroud. This shroud was purchased by Joseph of Arimathea, quote, a rich man who was a member of the Sanhedrin. And it's um, and so when you look at the manufacture of the shroud itself, it is a very expensive three-to-one herringbone pattern uh, uh, weave that is doable in first century. We've found, you know, rare examples, uh, like all the way at least back to the second century, but you hardly ever find it because mm. it's expensive and therefore rare. And so and so the fact that you have the image of a man who's clearly crucified, died a criminal's death, and yet wrapped in a rich man's shroud, this doesn't happen. It just it just doesn't. Mm. And so and so which is which is interesting because that directly relates to a fulfillment of biblical prophecy yes. in in um, in Isaiah who, of course, is writing 700 years before Jesus ever was was even was even born, mm. and he says is that he shall make his grave with the with rich, the wicked rich and the rich in his death. Well, how do you do that? Well, number one, you're crucified, which is the criminal's death, between two thieves, and yet wrapped in a rich man's shroud, placed in a rich man's tomb. And so, this is a clear fulfillment of biblical prophecy. And um, so the, uh, there's, there's no question as to the identity of the man. And that, uh, you know, you know I, I always say, you know, you know I, I guess there's, you know, people ask me all the time, what do you think? Do you think it's authentic? <clears throat> Standard answer. Answer I give every time is, hey, I'm 90, 90, 90% there, 95. I'll, sure, I'll still give 5 or 10% of the possibility that there's some Medieval outer artist out there who predated Leonardo by several hundred years. We don't know who he is. We don't know how he did it. And he obviously never did anything else. I guess that's possible. But in my view, obviously not real likely. And so and so when you you know, so when you look at the alternatives, you see that's the problem. Is that is that is that people oh that's just the medieval that's just uh that's that's just the medieval artwork. Yeah, well, okay. Well, have fun with that. Because, because so far, no one has been able to replicate the shroud, you know, considering the fact that there are no artistic substances on the cloth to mm. account for the image. No mm. paint, ink, dye, pigmentation, stain. I mean, you know, so when you, you know, so you can't just glibly say that it's the work of some medieval artist because he, because number one, he's not identified and it's, um, and nor do we even, you know, you know, if, 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 if this was, I always, I tell people this all the time too, if this was an obvious work of art, we would have figured that out a hundred years ago. Mm. How hard is it to figure out whether something is the work of an artist or not? You can get a magnifying glass and figure that out. <laughs> and yet, and yet after all these thousands of hours of scientific analysis, we can't figure out how this image came to be. This is preposterous. I mean, you know, I mean, here we are in the in the in the in the twenty uh, first century, and we can't figure it out. You see, <clears throat> I think that's a strong proof point for authenticity. The fact that it remains a mystery after all these years, 
I mean, there's no mystery to anything Michelangelo did. There's no mystery to anything Picasso did. I mean, yet this remains a perennial mystery. Well, that's, that's incredible because all of the deep things of God are all mystery. Yeah. Every single one of them. How can anyone explain the incarnation? Want, to, want anyone care to walk me through that? How the how the how the Word of God became flesh? Kind of you know explain how that happened. You see, nobody can do that. No. All of the miracles of God, of um, of Jesus. I mean, how did he feed five thousand people with a boy's lunch? How do you do that? Explain that to me. <laughs> you see, see all of the deep things of God are all mysteries. Mm. So wouldn't it stand the reason? That the that the that the burial shroud that wrapped his lifeless corpse corpse at the at the point of resurrection wouldn't it be logical that the that the that the that his burial shroud would also be a mystery? And it is. Yeah, we yeah. can't figure it out. Yeah, absolutely. There's another um, interesting point that people seem to forget. Russ, the crown of thorns. I always used to think of. Why did Jesus wear them crown of thorns? There must be a reason for it. And it's easy. The symbolic meaning. Jesus reversed the curse of Adam. He took the curse. The, when Adam and Eve were cur the cursed, uh, was, was put upon the earth, the ground would grow fossils. And Jesus took that curse back on himself, on his shoulder. And that's what I believe right. that, that them, them crowns are for. He took them on his head, the curse. It's reversed. And they, they, say, they forget that. Right, I like it. I never even thought about that. Yeah, oh yeah. In my book, I was trying to figure out that there's a reason for everything, and that's right. that's you know them thorns. He took the curse of Adam, as we know, on his shoulders of the whole world. You know, that's that. On, that alone is evidence that he had to die. To, right. To, <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Let's touch on the um that we were talking about the um the blood the blood that you said there. Yeah. He said Dr. Alan Adler found no post mortem blood. What would you say to that? Well, I would say that Adler certainly found evidence of blood. Um it's 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 hard to chemically identify blood that's post mortem. Um you know, one of the things that Adler did find is that the blood appears to have a very high bilirubin content. And bilirubin is an enzyme that is released into the bloodstream during, during conditions of severe stress. So obviously crucifixion would be pretty stressful. And then um, the, uh, the other thing that, that uh, uh, I, to my knowledge, and I've read my, all of Adler's work, the, um, is that you know Adler would would not would, would would look at the at the at the other blood stains and 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 affirm that this man appears to be dead. I mean um, I mean so even though maybe you can't prove that chemically, 
by looking at the particles of the of the of the of the uh, of the blood that he was able to analyze under the microscope clearly when you when you when you look at the man forensically he's dead yeah yeah absolutely so let's move on to the next question um is there do you know what evidence do you know that's on the shroud that jesus was resurrected from the dead does it that shows on there well i think the resurrection you know, can simply be inferred. Um, we can't, you know, from a scientific standpoint, we can't prove that the shroud image is the result of the resurrection. But here's what we do know, that it does not appear that the image is is related to direct contact with a corpse. So, for instance, if we assume that there was a body in this cloth, then... That explains the blood stain. Blood stains would get on there because of because of direct contact with the body. That much we get, but but it doesn't explain the image because there are there are parts of the body that would not have been in direct contact with the cloth, but the image is clearly there, and albeit lighter. So there appears to be this kind of distance information that is encoded into the cloth, yeah. where the closer the, uh, the, the closer the body is to the cloth, the darker the image, the farther from the body, perhaps up to about four centimeters, and the image is still there except lighter, distance information. Now, what's really intriguing is when you, when you drill down into, into photomicroscopy and look at the individual fiber of the cloth under under close-up microscopy you begin to see number one the image is a is a monochrome image there's no variation in color it's the identical color throughout front and back everywhere same color now it's also what's called a halftone image it is it is it is halftone because where the image appears darker, you simply have an increasing number of individual microfibers are affected by whatever caused that image. Where the image appears lighter, you simply have fewer of those individual microfibers affected. So where the image appears darker or lighter, it's not because of any more or less of a substance, because there are no substances on the cloth. Yeah. And the um, and so which. So, you know, one of the most important attributes of the shroud is its extreme superficiality. So, in other words, when you look at the shroud, and you'll, I'm sure you'll have images, you know, in here, you know, the, the first thing you see are the burns and the patches. You know, a very prominent series of burn marks from a fire in 1532. And then during the fire, it was doused with water. And you have a very, you know, you have a whole pattern of water stains on the shroud. And then, of course, you have your blood stain. Well, if you were to take the cloth and flip it over, you would see the burns, you'd see the water stains, you'd see the blood stain. But what you would not see is the image of the man. The image of the man is a purely superficial phenomenon affecting only the top one to two microfibers. Not thread, microfibers. Each individual thread is made up of about 200 microfibers. So this image literally resides on less than one percent of a single thread, and so, and so when you're looking for an artistic process, it says, well, "What kind of process is this hmm. that 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 accounts for you know that can you know creates an image that is uniform in intensity, top to bottom, front to, to back." no variation in color, and only resides on less than 1% of a single thread. And yet, the blood goes all the way through. Now, one of the clear things we know is that it appears that the, that the, that the blood was on the cloth first, followed by the image, because there doesn't appear to be any image under the blood. Brilliant. I heard and of this, yeah. Three days. So this tells you, then, that the order of events is that the blood was on the cloth first, mm. followed by the image. Now, mm. now, 
That makes sense if it's authentic. Good Friday followed by Easter Sunday, right? Mm. But it really makes no no sense if it's if it's the work of an artist. And there's been any number of attempts by various you know uh, artists to show how some alleged medieval artists created the image. And they and they go ahead and they craft their image. Most of them are pretty terrible. There's a few that are decent, but but they all break down eventually under the under the microscope. But they all make the same mistake. They craft their image, and then they just paint the blood where it's supposed to go. No, no, no. Blood first. Then image. You do that, and you've accomplished something. And to date, no one has been able to replicate everything we see on the shroud. And um, so as it, re- as, it, as it relates to the, the resurrection is this. It certainly does not appear that the shroud is a contact image with you know, various theories that the body came in touch with oils and aloes and sweats and this kind of absorbed into the cloth and brought about the image. No, it would be, you see, one of the things about the shroud image is that it is it is uniform in intensity, top to bottom, front to back. You almost think you need a piece of technology to uh, to do this. Mm. So, so if there's other theories that, you know, that, that perhaps, you know, ammonia gases began escaping from the body as it was beginning to decay, and um, and this somehow interacted with the you know with the cloth, and you, that's fine to allege. But here's the problem: is that gas is going to escape most prominently from all your natural orifices, your mouth, your nose, your eyes, your ears, and other orifices, and then but and then but it would it would not uniformly emit from the body. So you would have a very blotchy inconsistent image if it was a result of and um so it's not that you know so so we're still now i've always been in for light now why light is because everything about the shroud is perfectly consistent with the gospel account everything and so you know when now what's intriguing is that of all the miracles jesus did every single one of them had eyewitnesses Everything, his baptism, his, 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 his ascension, um, even his birth had, had multiple witnesses. Mm. And, yet, and yet there are no eyewitnesses to the, to the ultimate miracle that establishes him as the Son of God. That's the resurrection. So now, having said that, there's at least six post-resurrection appearances where he appeared after he was resurrected. By multiple and seen by multiple witnesses, but no witnesses to the resurrection event itself. So, if you're going to ask the question of what happened to Jesus in the tomb, you have to answer it by inference, looking at other verses of Scripture. Now, fortunately, the, we have some really good clues, and the first one is called the Mount of Transfiguration. Mm-hmm. Now, this occurred, you know, about six months before Jesus was even crucified. Most Many scholars believe that it probably happen, happened on the Feast of Tabernacles, and it's um, which is just coming up in September, and it's um, and so it's so if you from the uh, from the scriptural account it says that that Jesus went up to the top of a high hill, and Peter, James, and John are down at the bottom, and he says, and he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothing became dazzling like light, and so. So Jesus is transformed into this being of light before he was ever crucified. Then, about four or five years after the crucifixion, he appears to Saul, who is who later becomes Paul. Saul is on his way to Damascus, Syria, to round up some renegade Jews who had become followers of of of, uh, of Yeshua, followers of the way, and. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up in his path in a blinding flash of light, so bright that that, that Saul is is thrown from his horse. He's blinded for three days. Hmm. And so on either side of the crucifixion, Jesus is described as a being of light. So I always ask people this. Okay, so you put, you know, so just to a straight Bible study, what happened to Jesus the very split second his soul came zooming back into that lifeless body. There must have been an explosion of light and then gone. Mm. 
That's what I think. But it's hard to replicate that in the laboratory. But but you know, be, but but you see, it's it's interesting. Another clue. Remember, Peter and John ran to the tomb and saw the linen cloth lying there and believed that he had risen. And so it was so. so the, it was the empty burial shroud that was the first piece of evidence that Jesus had that Jesus had risen from the dead. People always talk about the empty tomb. It wasn't the empty tomb. It was the linen cloth lying there in the tomb that was the first piece of evidence. Yes. And so the uh, so you add all this all, all this up, and so what's interesting is that we've done a lot of experiments with. Um, with light over the years, and we haven't been able to come up with anything until recently, mm. 2011. Researchers with the with the with the E N E A E N E A. It's the think of, it's the Italian Agency for New Technology, and um, several scientists there have been experimenting with uh, with various lasers, in particular a um, a uh, a high power ultraviolet eczema laser it discovered and through a whole bunch of experimentation determined that a 40 nanosecond burst on this UV laser against a control sample of, of, of linen achieves the very same depth and coloration that we see on the shroud. And I think this is a huge piece of information Yeah, please. because because the most significant verse of scripture that tells, you know, that may give us a clue as to what happened to Jesus in mm. the tomb. That comes from 1 Corinthians 15. And in that in, and in that chapter, you know, Paul is, it, I mean, this, this whole chapter is about the resurrection. But in particular, he's not even talking about Jesus. He's talking about the future resurrection of the church. And listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians 15 around verse 50. He says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We will not all sleep, or that means remain dead, but we will all be changed. How? In a moment, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. Excellent. Yeah. So he's talking about this transformational event that's in the future. It hasn't even happened yet. Mm. But that's exactly what happened to Jesus in the tomb. Mm. Now, how do we know this? It's because Jesus is described as the first fruits of the resurrection. If he's the first fruits, that means we are the rest of the fruit that comes later at the end of the age. And so, and so this twinkle, this, 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 and I'm saying in a flash, maybe a 40 nanosecond flash, that's a, that is an incredible piece of data. Mm. And it doesn't prove that the shroud is the result of the resurrection, but it certainly is. Uh, is very compelling, and it's uh, and uh, so uh, so again. I always tell people, look, I don't know if the shroud's authentic or not. I just think it could be, and uh, and in my view, it most likely is. But as we explore the mystery, we encounter the message, and the and the and the message of the shroud is identical to the scripture. There is no difference. Brilliant. I think it's a, g- a good time to leave it there. It's fantastic. Uh, uh, we'll get this out, and um, we'll come back to you and do some more, if that's all right with you sometime. That, that sounds good, Simon. Fantastic, Russ. Thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you. I look forward to seeing it. I, yeah. I, hope, it, I hope it came out okay. So do I. I'll have a look soon, and, uh, yeah, speak to you soon. All right. God bless you, all brother. Right, well, God bless. Thank you. And say hi to Casper if you, if you talk to him before I do. Yeah, I will do. I'll be speaking to him very shortly. Okay, thanks a lot. God bless you, brother. Bye. Bye Bye-bye now. God bless.